Hi everyone, uh, welcome. In this video, I'm going to discuss about the security mechanisms, which is the uh, one of the concepts that has been mentioned in OSI security architecture. We discussed about the security attacks and also we discussed about the security services. Let's talk about the actual techniques or tools that are used for implementation of the security services to safeguard against attacks. As you can see here, usually a security mechanism is uh, one that is designed to detect, prevent or recover from a security attack. That is what the definition that has been given as part of our OSI security architecture. But it is not just one mechanism that is used to implement a particular service. Usually there is a combination of many mechanisms put together for one security service and one mechanism can be used to implement various security services in combination with others. You can see this, that no single mechanism that will support all the functions required. So X.800 divides the mechanisms into those that are implemented in a specific protocol layer called as specific security mechanisms and those that are not specific to any particular protocol layer or security service called as pervasive security mechanisms. In general, all the security mechanisms are divided into two categories. The first category is called as specific security mechanism and the second category is called as pervasive security mechanism. The main difference being here is that the specific security mechanisms, as you, the name itself tells you, they are specific and uh, are implemented usually in at one protocol or for one particular uh, area. So you can see this in for one particular protocol layer to implement one particular service, those are called as specific mechanisms. Whereas in general, where you can put them any protocol common to all the layers, such kind of mechanisms are called as pervasive security mechanisms. Here is the list of both the specific and the pervasive mechanisms. You can see we will discuss about each one of these things in detail. But this is the general categorization of mechanisms done by X.800. So let us discuss about each one of these in detail. And towards the end, let us see how these mechanisms actually fit in to provide your security services that we discussed earlier. Now, this, these are all the specific security mechanisms uh, that are given. First one is called as encipherment. Of course, encipherment is also called as encryption. The use of mathematical algorithms to transfer data into a form that is not readily intelligible. The transformation and subsequent recovery of the data depend on an algorithm and zero or more encryption keys. Simply put, if you want to send a message M from a sender A to a receiver B, if you want to send this particular message, rather than sending it in plain text so that everybody can see it, you are going to employ some you are going to employ some kind of mathematical algorithms on this message and convert it into a form which is unintelligible or an opponent cannot read this particular message that is what we call as encipherment here this x.800 actually divides the encipherment schemes into two categories again one the, they are called as reversible encipherment and the other one is called as irreversible. The main difference being reversible encipherment means encrypting the data at the sender and then subsequent decryption of the data to get the original data or to recover the original data that is sent by the sender. Irreversible encipherment do cover your hash algorithms, message authentication codes. Usually it is only a one way function. They are mainly used to verify the uh, authenticity of the sender and also to ensure integrity. So these are the two types of encipherment schemes as mentioned by X.800. So these two are the things which are employed on the message that is actually being sent by the sender to the receiver and they provide some specific service like confidentiality, integrity, authentication, those kind of things. Next comes digital signature. Digital signature usually involves some kind of data which is appended to or maybe a cryptographic transformation of a data unit that allows a recipient of the data unit to prove the source and integrity of the data unit and protect against forgery. So while the encipherment schemes try to hide the data from unauthorized disclosure, this digital signature scheme will allow that 
or will allow this message or will ensure the recipient that this message actually originated from A and also it ensures the integrity of the message. That means there is no unauthorized modification done on the data and it is in fact coming from the sender A itself. That is the main purpose of digital signature. The third security mechanism is called as access control. We discussed this as part of your security service also. Access control actually deals with variety of mechanisms that enforce the access rights to resources. Any kind of mechanisms that you are employing to control the access to the resource by, by the individuals can be, coming, can be termed as access control mechanisms. Next comes data integrity. These mechanisms might sound very much similar to your services. As I said, these are the ones which we implement to provide the services. That is the reason some of the names might look very much similar. You can see data integrity, a variety of mechanisms used to assure the integrity of a data unit or even a stream of data units. So or any data coming to the receiver or if the receiver receives M, receiver has to be ensured that this M is the exact copy of the one which is sent by A. So whichever message was sent by A has been received by B without any modifications on it. So these mechanisms can be implemented for just one data unit or for a stream of all data units from A to B. Next one comes authentication exchange. So a mechanism intended to ensure the identity of an entity by means of information exchange. Simply put, the information that is exchanged between A and B to assure A of the identity of B and vice versa. That is to ensure B that the identity of A. A is in fact genuine. So that comes under authentication exchange. Next mechanism is called as traffic padding. The insertion of bits into gaps in a data stream to frustrate traffic analysis attempts. As I told you, traffic analysis is a kind of passive attack. If you remember, this passive attack is very difficult to detect. It simply collects a lot of information and then the attacker tries to analyze this information and get some kind of information out of it. So what is that information that you might get? The identity of the sender, the identity of the receiver, even the location of the sender and receiver, the type of the message going on, the length of the messages. So all these kind of things. So traffic padding involves insertion of bits or insertion of dummy packets uh, maybe uh, fixing a maybe giving a fixed length to the packet so that the attacker might not understand what is the length, what is the original length of the packet that is being transmitted. All those kind of things to frustrate the attacker without doing the traffic analysis so that he cannot get enough information out of it. That is called as traffic padding. Next comes routing control. So enables the selection of particular physically secure routes for certain data and allows routing changes especially when a breach of security is suspected. That is also pretty similar. Now, if there is a data path from sender A to sender B, which uh, goes through two routers, maybe R1 and R2, this mechanism gives us the ability to change this physical route if you feel that maybe there is a security breach happening between R1 and R2. It allows us to choose a different path for these packets so that it goes through now through R3 rather than the path from R1 to R2. That is called as routing control. You might, you should be able to change these things, change the physical path of the packets because you are afraid that there, is, there might be a breach or this particular uh, path is prone to attackers. Last one is your notarization. The use of a trusted third party to assure certain properties of a data exchange. See, when there are two parties that are communicating, and in general, there is always a trusted third party. Maybe we call him as an attribute, uh, anybody, a certificate authority or someone like that, who sits in between and who is responsible for sharing the secret keys to both the parties. And also, uh, he uh, generally uh, takes care of any disputes that might arise between these two parties. So in that case, these notarization mechanisms or the techniques of notarization will come into play where a trusted third party can assure certain properties of the message between the two communicating parties. So all of these come under the specific security mechanisms. These mechanisms will be can be implemented at a particular layer or at a particular by a particular protocol and they can ensure 
you a particular kind of service they can they can provide you a particular kind of service which you would like to implement for your communication let's check out the pervasive mechanisms so you can see this the name of the pervasive mechanisms itself gives you an idea that they are not specific to one particular protocol or it, it need not be constrained to one particular layer the first one is trusted functionality that which is perceived to be correct with respect to some criteria. Maybe you have a policy saying that some particular person or some particular role is a trusted functionality or some particular action done by a particular entity is trusted. So those kind of criteria fall under this particular security mechanism, trusted functionality. Next is security label, the marking bound to a resource that names or designates the security attributes of that particular resource. Just imagine you putting a label on top of your book, claiming whose it is, what your name, the subject and all those things. Similarly, it is some kind of marking that is given to a resource or maybe a data unit and it designates what type of security service it has or what are the security attributes to whom does this resource belong to, who can access it, all those kind of things do come under the security label mechanisms. Third one is event detection. So how do you detect a security event? So any security related event, how do you detect it? All those detection kind of mechanisms, IDS, IPS, you can name a few, intuition detection systems, all those kind of mechanisms do come under the event detection mechanism. The fourth one, security audit trail. So as I told you earlier, accountability is also very important in security. Any action has to be linked to a specific individual or a specific system or even a specific process in that case. So data collected, and potentially used to facilitate a security audit, which is an independent review and examination of system records and activities. Those come under the security audit and trial. So it involves collection of the data, collection of the logs, who does what, uh, which system does what, or who is accessing what kind of resource, how much time they access, what is their password, login, all those things come under the security audit trail. The last mechanism, something called as security recovery, it actually deals with requests from mechanisms such as event handling and management functions to recover from a security attack that happened. How do you recover from a kind of security action that has taken place? That comes under the security recovery. So these are termed as pervasive mechanisms. And as I told you, they can be used uh, anywhere. They are not specific to a, a layer. So these are commonly used across the layers or across different protocols. Let's check out what is the relationship between uh, our services and mechanisms. I got this diagram from my from our textbook, the Stallings one, which we usually follow. You can see that security services and mechanisms share a close relationship with each other. One or more mechanisms are used together to provide a security service. Just not one particular mechanism. You can mix these mechanisms to provide a specific and a tailored service for your communication. Also, the same mechanisms could be used for other security services as well. You can see these are the list of the different security services that we studied earlier, isn't it? And these are the mechanisms. Let us say these are my specific mechanisms. And you can see that for peer entity authentication, you either can use encipherment, distal signature, and authentication mechanism. This why tells you that these mechanisms could be used or can be mixed together to provide this particular kind of service, peer entity authentication. Similarly, for data origin authentication, if you remember my earlier lecture, peer entity authentication is where when both the peers are to be authenticated. For, for a communication taking place during communication establishment and while the communication is going on, it has to ensure that both the peers remain true. That means no third party comes in middle and masquerades as the original party. So encipherment, that is encryption is there and then the digital signatures come into play and then the authentication exchange, which I just told you, where we share the information between the parties to ensure that both the parties are the exactly the ones which they claim to be. Next comes data origin authentication. For this, just encipherment and digital signatures are enough because data origin authentication does not deal with two parties, but it just ensures the sender of the message is genuine or not. That's all. If I receive a message, I have to be ensured that whoever is sending that message or whoever is in whatever name is written on the message, that is exactly where the message came from. 
that is enough in case of data origin authentication similarly access control we use access control mechanisms and for confidentiality you go for encipherment and routing control to ensure that there are no physical attacks that are done or to ensure that the packets do not go through an uh, uh, attacker prone path where they might be easily uh, uh, they, they become an easy target for the attackers next comes traffic flow confidentiality where encipherment traffic padding routing control mechanisms can be used data integrity encipherment digital signature data integrity uh, these things are used for non repudiation where a sender or a receiver cannot deny a sent or even a received message for that case you need to have digital signatures to simply identify uh, without any doubt that who actually sent this message then comes data integrity that the message has not been modified and also the authenticity of the sender and then comes notarization where a trusted third party can be used to settle the disputes and then comes availability so availability once again data integrity mechanisms authentication mechanisms and in some cases access control mechanisms can also be used to ensure availability so this this is the uh, how this is how the mechanisms fit into the domain of security where these mechanisms when you club them together when you mix them together they can be they can provide some specific service which is required for the communication so why are we doing all of this both the all these mechanisms are used to provide the services so that your data is safeguarded against the security attacks in the next video let us discuss about a security model which uh, might give you an idea how these particular services and mechanisms fit into the entire spectrum of security till then take care and good luck